Hey, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the Digital Jesuit Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room, and welcome to Padre's Corner. Now, what is Padre's Corner? I know a lot of you are asking. Well, Padre's Corner is pretty much anything I want it to be. It's a chance for me to spend some time, hopefully an hour every Friday, with the chat room with the wonderful men and women, the geeks and the gals who make Twit TV such an interesting place to work. Now, over the next 60 minutes or so, I'm just going to bring up any random topic that comes to my head. We're going to have an interesting guest who's going to talk a little bit about his experience trying to break into the industry and uh, share a few geek moments with me. But most of all, this is time between me and you, specifically to talk about the things that are going on in the news. Now, here's a question that I've got that I'm wondering if, if any of you share, and that is... Um, why do sloths poop on the ground? That's right. We just uh, heard about a study from Smithsonian.com about how sloths spend most of their lives in trees, but for some reason, they've baffled scientists by coming down to the forest floor to poop. They, they, they typically descend from the canopy about once a week. They've got a very high fiber diet, a whole lot of leaves, so they don't need to do it a whole lot. But when they do, since they have such a high fiber diet, a leafy diet actually, it's amazing that they spend all that energy, all that energy in a very low metabolism system in order to make it all the way to the ground. It's baffled scientists because it seems to be so contrary to, to what a sloth should do, how sloths should have evolved to protect themselves. Now, the other interesting thing about this is, well, you know, sloths are just damn cute. But beyond that, the scientists have found out that there's a symbiotic relationship going on between the sloth and their environment. When they come down to the ground to poop, what's actually happening is they're laying uh, nutrition, little, little food pods for moths. The moths will then lay their eggs inside the sloth poop. The sloths, when they come down to defecate once a week, will have the the mature moths grow into their fur, and then when they ascend into the trees, the, 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 the sloth fur itself becomes a little ecosystem where the, the moths will spend their entire adult life cycle, they'll lay their eggs for the next burden of poop, and also they'll decompose to become food for algae. Now, the, the big breakthrough in the study was they found out with that algae, the sloths, when they clean their hair, would ingest the algae and it would provide them with lipids, where this, which is a key high protein power boost. Not what they normally get from their leafy diet, which would then account for why they, they can spend that energy to go down to the forest floor. It's one of these uh, very interesting relationships that we found. It's a symbiotic relationship between an animal and the plant world. I, I find this fascinating because we, every once in a while, we get a story like this, a story talking about a new symbiotic relationship that has been found. And it seems as if these are far more common than we might believe. These symbiotic relationships exist everywhere. Now... Speaking of symbiotic relationships, you know the relationship that I most value is the relationship between us and cute. So I thought, hey, why not show you a video of a, of a bunch of cats being cute?
I remember, folks, drugs don't kill people. Cats on drugs kill people. Now, let's get back to our next story, and um, we'll talk about peanut allergies. Now, this, this actually is a story that I find absolutely fascinating. Most of us probably know someone with a peanut allergy, and it can be pretty severe. If, if you know someone with a moderate peanut allergy, normally they, they carry a, a, an EpiPen. Maybe, maybe they, they're really careful about what goes into their diet. Sometimes it, it gets a little strange to see what their dietary requirements are, but they have to be careful about what they put into their bodies. However, I've lived with people with serious peanut allergies, and it's 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 tough. It's rough on on everyone, uh, mostly because a peanut could actually kill them. Now, a new study has come out that has shown that it's possible to desensitize people to that peanut allergy. This is something that we didn't think was possible before. What they found is that if they use the standard allergy uh, method, which is to expose people to small bits of the allergen and then increase it and increase it and increase it, they can do an oral treatment for peanut allergies. It's a fascinating way to do it, but what really caught me about this study was the fact that the, the, the way they did it in a large, clinical, a large clinical trial in Lancet showed that the oral immunotherapy treatment can desensitize peanut to their peanut allergy over the course of two years. So what they did was that they, they gave them small tib tiblets of peanuts and they slowly built it up each and every single day until they were eating mostly like, like a whole peanut. They would continue this treatment for two years and if someone could keep up the treatment for two years, they built up an immunity up to five to 10 peanuts a day. Now, of course, there, there are side effects. There's gonna be a side effect anytime you're introducing an allergen directly into your body, but it's still a very promising study. And, and more than that, it's, it's good, good science. One of the things from the story that I took was if people stopped the treatment before the two year time period, they found that they could actually redevelop the, the allergy to peanuts within six months or so. So it, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done and they don't really have a, uh, um, a, an accurate template for each and every single person who suffers from a peanut allergy. This is again, one of those pieces of medicine that's going to have to be uh, uh, tailored for each individual who wants to, to be rid of a peanut allergy. But again, if you know anyone with a peanut allergy or if you've ever dealt with a peanut allergy yourself, this is fantastic news. Now, uh, hey, you know what? I know that those cats were not to make fun of. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, it hurts the heart to see an animal in distress, even if it, it was from a, from a drug that they took because of a surgery to, to relieve their pain. So instead of laughing at cats, um, why don't we laugh at some smart Germans? Hey, Darcy, look, 100,000 miles. So? It's a big deal. What if I told you that every time a Volkswagen hits 100,000 miles, a German engineer gets his wings? Uh, I hate these wingy thingies. Yeah, Dad, and I'm sure at 200,000 miles, rainbow shit out of their butts. Volkswagen has the most vehicles on the road with over 100,000 miles. That's the power of German engineering. Okay, I know it was an ad, but that's the beauty of having my own show. I could play anything I want. I found that this afternoon, and I, I think it's one of their Super Bowl ads. Actually, pretty funny. This I am one of these people who will actually watch. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not allowed to call, uh, call it that. Who will watch the big game. Yes, I want to see the game, but I really do love the creativity of the ads. And it makes you kind of wonder, why can't you do that the entire year round? Yeah, go figure. Let's go on to our next story. Have you ever seen something in your daily life, something that people take for granted, and you say, why is it made that way? That's, that's stupid. That's, that's ridiculous. Well, that's what happened with Peter Smart, who said, hey, wait a minute. Why is it that boarding passes are horrible? 
Uh, if, if you've ever taken a flight, you've seen this boarding pass. And the boarding passes that we have are are just terrible. It's, it's a mismatch of characters and numbers that may mean something to you if you work in the airline industry, but if not, it's probably just gibberish. I, I am a frequent flyer. For the last four years, I've probably flown about 200,000 miles a year. And even I, even though I know what to look for, I find it kind of strange that over the years we haven't figured out a better way to make a boarding pass. Of course, you could get an electronic boarding pass, and that's what we would prefer. But for people who don't fly all that much, getting that little piece of paper that is supposed to be important, and yet it looks just ridiculous, not a good thing. So what Peter did was he designed a better boarding, boarding pass. Now, here's the cool thing about this design. It's the same size and shape of the boarding passes we have right now. So you can use all your current equipment to, to print out this boarding pass. Even the color is built into the paper, not into the printer, so that you don't have to swap out your printer. So this is something that every airline can adopt right now. With a slight change to the programming, they can print this vertical, this portrait, instead of a landscape uh, or is that the other way? Yeah, a portrait instead of a landscape ticket that says a whole lot more. This gives you information in an easy-to-understand format. Your flight, your gate, date and time, the time zone that you're going to be leaving in, the time zone that you're going to be landing in. It's one of these things that makes me say, hey, you know what? There's still people out there who are trying to reinvent the very, very common. So here's something that I want to I wanna challenge the chat room to right now. If you look around and you find something that we've taken for granted, it could be anything, anything that you think we need to redesign, I want to hear from you. Now, emails would be great. You could email me at padre at twit.tv. You could tweet me with a picture of your design at, uh, at padre, uh, padre Este on Twitter, or even better, make a video make a video you, and you, maybe you don't have to build it if you're not if you're not a tinker don't build it but have some sort of idea of something you want to change that you think could affect millions of people across the planet and we'll put it on the show and then I'll give you 10% of whatever your idea is because yeah I'm I mean like that let's go on to our second bit of geeking out I don't know how many of you are F1 fans I I'm not a huge F1 fan, but I do really, really enjoy the technology, specifically the technology that makes everything so wonderful. Now, F1 in 2014 is going to be adopting a brand new engine design. Actually, they don't even want to call it an engine design anymore. They're calling it the power unit. It's it's a very interesting piece of technology that is sort of a, a accumulation of all the knowledge that they've learned about engine design over the last year. Specifically, how do you make an engine that is faster, that is smaller, that is safer, and more efficient? What they've come up with is this V6. So they're going down from a V8 down to a, a V6 engine, from a 2.4 liter down to, I think it's a 1.6 liter, that will still give 760 horsepower. It's turbocharged, 30% more efficient, and it's a hybrid, hybrid design. So multiple hybrid powertrain, multiple vectors of energy recovery. Now, all engines are now direct port injection, so they don't mess around with carburetors anymore. And here's the thing. If any of you know about engine design, you know about the turbo hole, the turbo lag. These designs use a supercharger, which is, uses the exhaust gas, the expanding exhaust gas, the very hot exhaust gas, to turn a turbine, which then turns a compressor, which drives air into the engine, which boosts up your horsepower. Well, it's a great design because you're using something that's normally wasted, the exhaust gas, to increase your boost. But the problem with a turbo a turbocharger has always been there's this thing called the lag. In between you putting your foot down and the turbocharger being able to provide additional boost to the engine, there's a short a period of time where the, the turbine has to spin up. And then when you release your foot from the throttle, there's also that, uh, that thing that you see in the Fast and Furious movies all the time when you, you've got that... And that's the exhaust gas coming. That's the uh, that's the turbine releasing its pressure because if the engine is spooling down, it no longer has a place to put all that that high boost air. Now this new design is actually going to capture exhaust gas from that moment up. Uh, and rather than venting it out into the air, it's going to continue to turn the turbine, which will then turn a motor generator, which will then provide power into a power unit. Now here's the cool thing. When you put your foot back on the, on the throttle, 
it will actually spool the turbine up with the energy that it recovered so that it could provide you an immediate boost. There's no longer a turbo hole. There's no longer a turbo lag. The second you put your foot on that pedal, you're getting all the boost possible. Now, I, I mentioned that this has multiple vectors of energy recovery. It also uses one of those standard hybrid powertrains. So if you hit the brake before it actually applies the brake, it will use the entire powertrain to recover energy from the car, which it will then use to charge up the battery, which will then be used when you need a little extra boost to pass. Now, I, I know there's a lot of people out there who are saying, it's, it's F1, who cares? But this kind of technology does make it down into the consumer market. And it's interesting to see how the Grand Prix of racing, the, the Premier League, is now looking at more efficient ways to get their boost on. Now, I'm thinking now might be a really good time for me to introduce my guest. Ladies and gentlemen, he's a man who needs no introduction, at least to me. It's Mr. Chase Noons. Chase, thank you for, uh, for coming on to the show. Uh, you know what would be good if I, if I hit guys. that button right there. Yeah. Chase, uh, so how about this? Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, sure. and where you're from? Well, I uh, live in the Pacific Northwest, uh, just north of Seattle, small little town called Marysville. I was originally born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area in Sonoma and actually went bowling in Petaluma uh, when I was growing up. Um, basically, I've been involved in, in technology and gaming and in the podcasting, netcasting realm for the past eight years and uh, met up with you online and this they say the rest is history and so i'm happy to be here indeed now chase i know that uh you're not just another chat realmer who says hi you actually put out some pretty decent content I, I i've said this several times i like your style i like what you do you've got a golden voice you've got a good presence on camera and you've used it to create your own little niche of the internet uh, can, can you tell us about it well, uh, basically right now, just because of, of time and, and fundage, I, I create two shows. I do a show on gaming and technology called Geek Gamer Weekly. Been doing that for about eight years and where we bring people in uh, into our small circle of friends where we just talk about the latest and greatest. And then about two years ago, uh, a friend of mine introduced me to a small little game called Minecraft. Never, never even heard of it before and uh, did a show called Minecraft Me where we uh, show people how to play the game and uh, we go through many different aspects and talk about the snapshots and things of that nature. So, and then obviously I review technology, gaming. We just got back from CES a few weeks ago and got the plague and uh, did niche interviews. We focused in on going after the, the smaller companies, the ones that don't get the mainstream attention and uh, did that. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, so did you get yeah. this? Did you get the CES uh, con funk, con crud? Yes. You did? Yes. Oh, I, Our I, whole crew got it. Ooh. It was terrible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, supposedly the one going around right now is H1N1, so you got swine flu? Was Is that, <laughs> is that the... <laughs> That's the swine flu, yeah. Awesome. Very good, <laughs> very good. Now, I, I, I was lucky enough to avoid Concred. I've actually avoided Concred at CES for the last three years. Wow. Uh, mostly because that's the time of year that I get ultra paranoid. I won't shake your hand. <laughs> I won't... I won't kiss you hello or, you know, pat, pat you on the cheek. I kind of stay away from people, which is weird because you're pressed together with half a, a quarter of a million visitors to the city. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. you can do the fist bump thing. Uh, I know that uh, Howie Mandel does the fist bump thing because he's uh, like a germaphobe, right? I think that's the official term. Uh, one, of, one of my friends was suggesting to me, hey, why don't you carry a, a small bottle of hand sanitizer? And I thought that was a brilliant idea until I uh, got to the show and didn't bring it. And, and so, you know, you, you start shaking hands with everybody, then pretty soon you, you come back and then you're on a small enclosed airplane and small cars and then you get it. Yeah. But uh, you know what? Even though I got sick, it's one of those things that if you can go as a journalist and, and cover it in the media form, it's so much fun. You get to, to learn about so much great tech. Yeah. Over the years, I I think I figured out that it's not so much the fact that you're packed together with all those people. I think it's because people allow their bodies to get so tired. Uh, if oh, you're jumping yeah. from meeting to meeting, from event to event, uh, and then you go back to your hotel room or your house and you start editing all the packages together. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but it it was like 18-hour days for me. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the the worst thing is, you know, you're you're popping like the ibuprofen or whatever, so you make sure your feet aren't falling off at the end of the day. And uh, we stayed off the strip. We stayed about 20 miles, uh, not 20 miles away, but about 20 minutes away in a small little hotel called Sam's Town. And I was thinking, hey, I'm going to try to put this video up the same day and edit. 
And the internet connection just was not allowing that. But yeah, you know, it's one of those things where you, we we mapped out like, our, we're going to do the South Hall today. We're going to do uh, North today. And then we're going to go over to the Venetian today. And, and pretty soon it's the end of the week. And then your body's just exhausted, right? And you're you're trying to keep yourself motivated and keep yourself going. But by the end of the week, you're, you're ready to go home. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know that feeling. The whole idea of, oh, we, oh it's, it's Sunday and I'm going to put yeah. out. 12 videos a day and I'm going to be able to edit everything down. And yeah, you could probably do that the first, maybe the second day, but by that third day, you're just sort of, you're walking dead. You're like, uh, you yeah. know what? You know what? Maybe I'll just save some stuff for next month. I'll do, yeah. I'll, I'll edit it. And, and then here's, here's what I love. Uh, I love editing videos like a week after CES and you can't remember the context and you can't remember the cues. You can barely remember who you talk to and you're like, uh, some guy CES. <sighs> Yeah, you get the stack of business cards, right? And you're like, and there's there's a lot of PR firms that work on behalf of other companies. So what you do is you get these cards and they're they're from PR companies. So instead of talking with Razor, you really talked with a PR company that's working for Razor. And then you have this company like, I don't remember talking to them. And then pretty soon it's like, I don't remember anything. And then pretty soon you have no context other than the video itself. And then you feel totally dumb like, how do I thank these people and write an email? Like, I, I think I saw you tweet, like, you know, you're you're writing back to all the people that you spoke with. I mean, how did you do that? I mean, how are you able to remember? Did you have a, a secret? Yeah, the, the secret is, and I, I, this is going to sound stupid, but the secret is you do it as soon as possible. I mean, literally yeah. the day I got back, I went through all the cards and I, I was putting videos to names on the cards. And and also at the, at the show, I've gotten so accustomed to this. Uh, I will take the time and I will tape uh, uh, tape like a, little, a brief video in, in on all the clips of who's in this clip so it's actually on my video if i lose the card or if it gets out of order or if, or if i get to write down what company that representative is is working for i can always go back to the tape and say oh okay this this belonged to the to the uh, the razor representative or yeah. this belonged to the belkin representative that yeah. it's little tricks like that you you learn over the year now, sure. I, I don't want to go on ces all uh, all forever yeah. so how about this chase Will you sit with me and go over some tech stories? Oh, I'd love to sit down in your corner, Padre, and let's go through them. Let's go through Padre's corner. So this is the first story we've got. It's an interesting little uh, ditty that I think uh, might strike well here in the United States, and that is in the United Kingdom. In the EU, they are purportedly working to make tracking not only mandatory, but the ability to turn off engines part of the package by 2020. Now, Chase, this is a, a cool little story that I pulled up from uh, was the Daily Mail that uh, that UK that mm -hmm. talked about a secret meeting, and they make it kind of sound clandestine, probably more clandestine than it actually was. It's a secret meeting in Brussels between what are they called the European Network of Law Enforcement Technology, and they propose to have a technology developed and fully implemented by by post 2020. The technology itself has to be ratified by 2020. That would be included in all cars. That would give law enforcement the ability to shut down engines during situations that might require them. Now, the way that they're couching it is, is to say, we don't know yet what all the legal ramifications are going to be. We just want to have the technology available. So is there a way for you to bake this into cars? Could we mandate it? And then say, maybe, I don't know, is there a warrant system that I need in order to shut down a car? Or can, can it only be accessed for, by certain law enforcement officials? Let me ask you, what would the sensibilities be here in the United States to something like that? Well, I remember a few years back, I want to say maybe 10 years back, um, and this is this is a, even longer than that, they proposed to put on the back of 18-wheeler trucks on the back of the trailers where a cop, let's say a truck is out of control, where a cop could ram the back of that truck and it would it hit the levers or it would in, you know fold in the bumper and thus engage the brake system and stop or like a runaway truck or whatever. Obviously, in light of what Edward, Edward Snowden has been revealing to us over the past few months uh, through his uh, through his journalistic contacts, I don't think that would fly here very well, especially when you have people who try to get like crash data from their own vehicles and they can't even get that. And we've already seen internal abuses with our federal and state levels of government. And so you have something like this where you could have a cop potentially, you know, throw on an app, right? And go, okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and shut down this car. For what? For the 
for the sub 1% of people who are trying to run from the law, I, it, it just seems a little bit of an overkill situation to prevent those those one high speed, you know, speed chase a year. Yeah. Now we've got a, the smartest chat room in all the internet and we've got real, bo real body who is saying, well, yeah, the, the daily UK is the daily mail is a rag. Absolutely is a rag, but I don't think the facts are at dispute. No. Now, uh, of course, the Daily you, the Daily Mail is trying to make it sound like a clandestine meeting. I don't actually think it was. I think it was a bunch of geeks getting together and saying, <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if, and yeah. wouldn't it be nice if we could include this? A and yes, let's 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 get all the knee-jerk reactions out of the way because the knee-jerk reaction is going to be, no effing way, or, you know, <laughs> as the chat right. room has said, yeah. well, now I'm going to drive around in a Faraday cage and good luck <laughs> getting, getting to the transmitter and the receiver. But let me ask you this. It's an invasion of privacy. It's an invasion of what we've expected out of our privacy. But in an age of social media where I think there's, there's at least subconsciously, there's an agreement that I'm going to give you some of my privacy in exchange for something that is of value to me. So right. in exchange for entry into a social network or information about friends and family. What if it was pitched more as a safety thing to say, hey, look, if you volunteer to get one of these installed into your car, uh, and it will only be used if your car is out of control or if it's been taken over by a criminal or if it's being used in in a, in a crime, then we'll give you half off your insurance premiums or or we'll we'll uh, we'll knock something off your registration. You'll get some sort of financial incentive to install this piece of technology. Would that do you think that would change the mindset of people saying, eh, okay, it's it's like it's like having a seatbelt or it's like having any other intrusive piece of technology. I can I can take it or I can leave it. But I think I'd rather take the $600 a year in savings. It could, but it does set a dangerous precedent. And that is we're exchanging conveniences and monies with, with freedom and our, our privacy, right? The one thing, you know, with this kind of thing, and they, they point to post-2020 timelines, I'm more in the camp of, well, if I'm going to give up privacies and freedoms, I'd rather, instead of having a car that can be auto-stopped, by an app or someone else, or even perhaps hacked into, you never know. I'd rather have a self-driving car. <laughs> I'd rather have that kind of, of, of full capabilities. Instead of taking your technology in, in these think tanks and putting it into a car like, hey, we want to remotely stop a car. Why don't you just go ahead and automate the system? You would figure that would be a little bit more easier to do. I'm not sure, but it, it honestly, it, it sets a bad precedent when you're saying, well, we're going to give you a discount to take away some of your freedoms. But that, you got to be a little careful. That's an interesting point because, yeah, I would rather have a self-driving car. But by definition, wouldn't a self-driving car have the ability to be shut down remotely? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, true. exactly. So, yeah. So, could you say, hey, uh, in the United States, we're not going to install a device that gives the police a, the power to shut down your car. But, oh, by the way, here's your self-driving car. It's connected right. to the Google, Google servers. Oh, yeah. by the way, if if the if Ellie were ever to come to us and say, shut down this car, it's being used for a crime, we would totally do that. Or, or, or better yet, what if they could drive your car directly to the police station? <laughs> they, they lock your lock car. Lock the doors. Drive and they just the drive you like, like Minority Report directly to the station. It'd be great, right? Real simple and easy. They wouldn't even have to arrest you. They just drive you right into jail. So this this is one of these things that I, I, I'm fascinated by. And that is how willing we become to turn over some of the, the personal freedoms and the private freedoms that, that we, hold, we think we hold so dear as long as we get something shiny. And I know that's a simplification. That's more of a, that's a knee-jerk, you know, link bait type thing. But it's kind of true, right? I, I'm, you, I'm willing. It, let's go back 20 years. Okay, for me, that's, that, I'm still an adult. But let's, for many people here, actually, they're not alive. But let's go back 20 years before yeah. the internet and before, uh, uh, you know, these online services really became popular. It would have been absolute pandemonium if I had walked into a city hall meeting because that's that's where people gathered. That's where people got their social, their social media, their information. And right. I sat there in front of 400 people and said, hey, I would like to collect all of your phone numbers, addresses, names, and next of kin, and I'd like to know what TV channels and newspapers you've been reading. It, it'd be bedlam. People were like, what do you, wait, what? But we won't collect your names. We're just going to collect the data, you see. We won't collect your names. We just want to collect the data and then just compile that information. And don't worry, it's not personally identifiable. But we all know that, you know, through that metadata today, it's not very hard. So, 
you got to be careful there. I mean, that's it, it, it. It's one of those situations where I kind of equate it maybe to the the frog in the in the uh, in the boiling pot, right? You, you stick a frog in a boiling pot, it's going to jump right out. But if you put the frog in, you know, we've heard the story, right? You put it in the warm water and slowly turn up the heat. Eventually, the frog won't realize it's being boiled to death. And we have to be alert. We have to keep our eyes and ears open on these kind of situations because they can set a president. Uh, precedent and we got to be careful about that yeah the price of freedom is vigilance but at the same time yeah. someone's screaming over and over you're all sheep you're all sheep you're all sheep that that doesn't that doesn't work much either java right. in the chat room actually brought up a good point he said padre we lost all that with credit cards <laughs> once people started using credit cards i mean yeah. do you really have an expectation of privacy if you're using someone else's service to buy the things that you need it's true i, I don't know i don't know so uh, i mean what do we think about this story? Obviously, let's 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 get away get away from the flame bait. Let's get away from the link bait, the the knee jerk reactions. Would something like this work? Could you sell this to the public in the United States? Be it through saying they're getting a self driving car, saying it's it's going to reduce their premiums. Do you think the average citizen by 2020 would have such a low expectation of privacy in the in the outside world, outside of my house, that they'd say, yeah, this this, this sounds perfectly reasonable? I think the way to sell this, Padre, is really simple and easy. Let's say, for example, you, you've gone into your Tesla dealership and you're, you're picking up your Tesla Model S. And no, they're not paying me for this. But let's say you walk into that dealership and you're picking up that car and they say, hey, by the way, we have a great new option for this vehicle. Not only we can track it by uh, GPS, but in case your car gets stolen, what we can do is we can stop that car no matter where it is remotely and you can get your car back without any damage or something along those lines. It's all about the sales pitch, right? So if they sell it that way, and I think there's already those systems that are out there. I think LoJack is one of them, right? But if we could add that system to any car, maybe as an option at first, and then eventually become standard equipment, that's how you spin it as a matter of safety and security. Hey, I can keep my car secure because if it does get stolen, I could shut it down remotely and hit a button, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, Chase, I think we've, uh, we've run this into the ground. How about we move on? Let's do it. All right. So we've got a little something, something here. What about Amazon's Prime? Is their Prime number negative? Now, Amazon recently reported that their revenue has disappointed and a lot of people are crying foul. Amazon has 237 million active customers, but they make almost no profit. Now, many have blamed the lack of profit on Amazon's awesomely low shipping prices. If you're a Prime member and 250, sorry, 25 million of us are, you get free second-day delivery on most of your purchases and free or generous return policies for most products. The end result has been wonderfully happy customers, but not so happy investors. Amazon is looking at boosting Prime memberships by up to 50% from its current $70 price. So, Chase, my question to you is, well, it's always been assumed that you could build a business, a successful business, by chasing the expansion, chasing the expansion, and worrying about profits later. You, you would expect, That's why you raise rounds of funding. You expect to burn money at the beginning. You're not going to be profitable from the outset. But Amazon has been around for a long time. They've been growing for a long time, and people are starting to say, well, why are we chasing the expansion if if the profit's not going to come. So so does this does this change the expand now profit later structure that we become accustomed to in the internet generation? Well, I think we all a lot of us saw the the special on 60 minutes with the Amazon Prime Air drones uh, that they hope to launch in the future. And you know, Jeff has uh, Jeff Bezos talked about a little bit how they've returned their profits back into the expansion of the company. Well, Maybe they, instead of, you know, worrying about uh, expansion, like you're stating, dialing it back a little bit and bringing more money in-house and maybe instead of opening up, you know, 20 distribution centers a year, maybe bring it down to 10 and just kind of dial it back a little bit and bring more to the investors. Um, I know where you're going to you know, get into the, the potential of uh, raising the costs of Amazon Prime to maybe offset some of those losses. However, you know, it's all a matter of how they're reinvesting those costs. And right now, I think they're, tr they're trying to be the distribution for everything that you buy online, you know, from, you know, electronics to actual books, of course, and things of that nature. So maybe they need to dial that back a little bit instead of maybe spending so much on expansion and maybe just bring it back in house. 
Now, Chase, let me ask you. Right now, Prime is $79. Are you a Prime subscriber? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I I, I actually I use it all the time. I, I yep, buy too. pretty much everything exclusively from Prime. But I think the bigger thing for me has always been all the added services that you get. For example, with Prime, you get free snubs. And uh, that's <laughs> that's one major, major benefit. No, but, but yeah. seriously, would you pay $120 for your Prime? See, here's the thing, right? Let me, let me kind of flip this around a little bit. You have high-speed internet access, right? You have high-speed at home. And say you have fiber like I do. Thank God. I love, I love having fiber internet. And let's say the internet company came to me and said, uh, Chase, uh, we're going to raise your prices by 20%, maybe even 50% because we need to offset our costs for whatever reason they give. Yep. Am I going to drop fiber? Probably not. And the reason why I'm not going to drop fiber is because I'm so you know attached to that service. Uh, for Amazon, I would pay it because I buy everything I, I can on Amazon whenever possible. I use their streaming service. And I kind of always try to justify the cost of that membership, right? By utilizing those services. So I'll probably end up even ordering even more equipment <laughs> and items through Amazon to justify, oh, I'm going to need to pay 130 bucks a year. I got to order more stuff now to make it worthwhile. And that's probably what I would do. I have to say right now, my uh, obsession is Stargate Universe, which I'm currently getting on uh, Amazon Prime. It's allowing me to watch all of that, uh, the, the, the two series, which I really miss. Uh, were you a Stargate Universe guy? A little bit. I mean, it's more for me is, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, um, you know, those kind of programs on, on the telly. By the Not way, too I, much Stargate. I have just been informed uh, that the uh, on the bookshelf behind you, uh, just yes. above Twit Twit Twit, is a picture that has the Flowmaster, who is uh, uh, Alex Gumpel here at yes. uh, Twit TV. Yes. Yeah, we're a strange family. By the way, uh, you should know that many of the Twit crew have just come back and they are very drunk. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I know that guy over over your right shoulder there. Yeah, Al Alex. Yeah, he's uh, he's been actually in this space here before. He's He's been in the Geek Gamer TV studios. Uh, whenever he's come up for PAX, we, we tend to hang out. And you should ask him about dicks. He loves dicks. Drive in. Uh, no, drive in. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Uh, we're we're going to move on because I, I think that's opening up a, a hotbed of things that I really don't want to talk about. <laughs> so it's drive in, people. It's, it's a drive in in Seattle. It's been around for 60 years. It's very good. Okay. Great burgers. All right. Great burgers. Now, Chase. Let me ask you. You've got your yeah. ear to the ground. You've uh, you've been taking uh, advantage of all the uh, the advances that the internets, the interwebs have given us. Yes. And uh, let me ask you: Have you heard about the uh, the asshat who is getting outed by uh, by 4chan? <laughs> Dude, he needs to be outed. I mean, I have a I have two pets. You know, I have a cat and a dog. And man, this is why the internet is so good and so cool because people who do these kind of things to defenseless beings and animals deserve, deserve to be tracked down. Yeah. So I, let me, let me give a, for the people, at fo the folks yes. at home who may not know about this, here are the basic uh, facts. We all like it when these, uh, these a hats get their uh, come up and but the slash the the, uh, the 4chan, the, the slash bomb mob has ident identified this Frenchman who was found throwing a cat 20 feet against a building wall, then landing in obvious pain on the concrete. Now, the interesting thing was that this guy actually put the video on his own Facebook uh, <sighs> page, which which tells me that he thought there was absolutely nothing wrong with it, which is right. just kind of mind-boggling. And yeah. even after the uh, after 4chan started getting the fear up, he kept it up. So I don't know if that was defiance, stupidity, whatever it might be. Mm. 4chan was able to identify this guy. They got his name, his phone number, his address, yeah. his email address, and they were able to forward, forward all that information to the, the local law enforcement. Now that, that video has come down and people are waiting to see if people will, will if the LE will actually press charges. But my question is pretty specific, and that is, do you think that this sort of mob mentality is the future of justice on the internet? We've seen it before. 4chan is very good at this, at outing yeah. people who we, most of us would agree are, are asshats, but they've gotten it wrong before, right? I mean, 4chan yeah. was instrumental in identifying the wrong person as the Boston bomber. Yeah. So, Mike, you know, is 
Is this something that we we are going to look forward to? Is this something that you think at some point we're going to get fed up with and say, look, you can't keep outing these people. You got to get let, let law enforcement do their job. It's it's a dangerous slope, right? Uh, because what will happen is, you know, we've seen it obviously with the with the Boston uh, bomber, the marathon guy, and he was, you know, wrongly accused, and it just turned into a living hell for that dude. It really did, and you know, he couldn't show his face online. He couldn't show his presence. He couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't do anything because everybody thought that he was a terrorist. Now that being said, it it's tough because if we have clear cut and dry evidence, like, you know, this guy, he was in the videos. We saw what he looked like. We knew who he was. Uh, once we've, you know, once they're able to uncover it and dig it out, it's tough, but it should still be turned over to authorities. They, people should not be vigilantes in these kind of situations, no matter how heinous the crime may be, because then we start going into a danger, dangerous area where we're criminalizing people and they're guilty until proven innocent. Even though, I mean, and that, and I, you know, I believe in our justice system. I, I, I would hope to believe in it that you know we're all innocent. We should be put in a front of a jury of our peers, and there should be evidence presented in, in both sides. And these kind of situations, there's the evidence. There's the evidence against you, right? So it would be an open and shut case. But then when you start playing vigilante, it gets really, really dangerous, and it's not a path I like to go down. It's funny to see this guy get caught. But at the same time, you know, he shouldn't die per se, but he should be tried to the extent of the law. Yeah, it's, it's one of these things where I think everyone, everyone who's not a psychopath would agree that that this guy deserved to get caught. I mean, for, yeah. for doing, I mean, let, let even if you hate animals, the fact that someone is torturing an animal like that tells me that there's something wrong. This is not a person that you just want to let loose on the streets. But my question would be, do you think there's a way to channel this energy? Because when you get the the 4chan mob or the anon mob or if you get the the slash b crew up they can do amazing things i mean yeah. the brain power that they can bring to bear is just staggering yeah i i think there's ways to to turn it for good i mean you have plenty of high um, high end new, uh murder cases that are cold case files all over the united states and around the world where, you know, a family is missing, you know, a kid or, you know, there's this murder that's never been solved and they have, you know, scarce clues. I th really think, you know, you should have police departments and other governments, if you will, take advantage of the resources that are out there and say, hey, look, we have the six year old case, explain the facts, explain what's going on and maybe take it to the community. And I don't think we see that happen as much. I mean, of course, you see traditional news media where they go on crime stoppers and they go, well, here's the story of this guy who did this sort of thing or gal or whatever, but they don't really take it to, to, <laughs> to slash B. They don't, they don't take it to these guys and say, Hey, look, we know you guys are the best at this. Let's see what we can do and work together. But instead, uh, law enforcement agencies look at slash, slash B and other websites like it, where all oh, these guys are on the internet, they're evil, they're hackers, they're bad people or whatever. And that attitude needs to change. We need to be working together, not against. And if they did, I think we would see more good positive stories where we're catching people that need to be caught in, in the bad sense. Got it. Well, Chase, how about this? I'm thinking that maybe now would be a good time to talk about our addictions. Uh, addictions. Oh, yeah. Now, right here, normally, there would be a bumper. There'd be this awesome bumper. So just imagine. Um, I... I I'm actually getting back into an old anime classic. I remember before Ready Player One, before I really got into to some of the, the more current anime, I was big into a show called uh, Dot Hack. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Yeah, so Vaguely. There, it, it, it's, it's not a very original premise. The idea is in the near future, people have figured a way to get a very realistic experience in this massive multiplayer online role-playing game where you could be these these rogues and these knaves. And, uh, well, I've I've kind of... Fallen, fallen back into it. I, I found it on Netflix the other night, and you know I like the anime style. I like the uh, the uh, the overall plot line. I, I like the material that it deals with, and I like the fact that you have really tight episodes with uh, with a little bit of drama. Now, one of the things that I really like about the uh, the dot hack on Netflix is that they only do the OVAs, which tend to be a bit more compressed. People, when they watch the original series, they, they tended to, to lose interest after a while because it goes on for so long. But uh, I, I've kind of, I've gotten gun back into it. I, I think this, this is actually going to hold me at least for a week. So that <laughs> is 
my current addiction. What about you, Chase? Uh, what what have you found that's uh, freaking you out? I well, I, I have a few addictions right now. Uh, one of them is Yelp Archer. I am so hooked on that series right now. It's not even funny. And I'll go back and watch old stuff just because it's so good. And then I start going online and, and looking for the the actors doing, uh, you know, se uh, seminars and, and uh, Q and A's and that sort of thing. So I'm completely hooked on Archer right now. I'm also hooked uh, on FIFA 14 for the Xbox One, playing a lot of soccer. And then Battlefield 4 on the PC. I'm still playing that as well. So I... Uh, but in sort of watching, kicking back, you know, just watching some stuff, Archer, and then since you brought up some some anime, uh, Sword Art Online, I've been watching that on Crunchyroll. You know, I I just pounded through the series. And in case you don't know about Sword Art Online, it's uh, it takes the premise of uh, kids and other people who are playing this online multiplayer game, but they put on this headgear and it actually puts the their whole entire selves into a game. And then what happens is they kind of get locked into that game and they can't uh, exit out of it and go back to the real world. It's a great, uh, great anime and uh, you can grab it on Crun Crunchyroll. It's really good. Actually, that doesn't sound all that different from Dot .hack because one, yeah. of the re one of the recurring themes in Dot .hack, actually, I think this is sort of a recurring theme in any anime that has a yeah. character entering into a virtual world is that somehow they can't leave at some right. point. Uh, that the safety protocols get disabled and suddenly they're feeling pain when they shouldn't or they, they can die when they, you know, they're in the game. But uh, yeah, okay, good. I, so I think uh, we are properly addicted. Now, yes. coming up next, we're going to get into the tech. Now, are you ready to talk some tech with me? Well, technology, I like tech. Yeah, tech let, is good. Let's, let's, let's talk a little <laughs> tech, but first I'm thinking that uh, maybe now might be a good time for, uh, uh, well, before tech, before we get elbows deep, let's get a little bit of... Uh, Shia LaBeouf? You're walking in the woods. There's no one around and your phone is dead. Out of the corner of your eye, you spot him. Shia LaBeouf. He's following you about 30 feet back. He gets down on all fours and breaks into a sprint. He's gaining on you. Shia LaBeouf. You're looking for your car, but you're all turned around. He's almost upon you now, and you can see there's blood on his face. My God, there's blood everywhere. Running for your life from Shia LaBeouf. He's brandishing a knife. It's Shia LaBeouf looking in the shadows. Hollywood superstar Shia LaBeouf living in the woods. Shia LaBeouf killing for sport. Shia LaBeouf eating all the bodies. Actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf. Now it's dark, and you seem to have lost him, but you're hopelessly lost yourself. Stranded with a murderer, you creep silently through the underbrush. Aha! In the distance, a small cottage with a light on. Hope! You move stealthily toward it, but your leg! Ah! It's caught in a bear trap! Gnawing off your leg! Quiet, quiet. Limping to the cottage! Quiet, quiet. Now you're on the doorstep! Sitting inside, Shia LaBeouf! Sharpening an axe, Shia LaBeouf, but he doesn't hear you enter, Shia LaBeouf, you're sneaking up behind him, strangling superstar Shia LaBeouf, fighting for your life with Shia LaBeouf, wrestling a knife from Shia LaBeouf, stabbing in his kidney, safe at last from Shia LaBeouf. You limp into the dark woods, blood oozing from your stump leg, but you've won, you have beaten Shia LaBeouf. And that's how we do that. I don't yes. know why we do that, but we do that. That's uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Chase, uh, yes. you, you're a big techie, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I kind of have to know technology to, to do the netcasting thing. So, yes. Well, if you're, doing, if you're a techie, then uh, what do you say we get into the tech? Let's get you. All right, so what I've got right here, this is a, a Y-Spy DBX. Uh, I've, I've been using y MetaGeek products for a while because I, I do a lot of professional work. But the, what I like about this is this is a radio that can detect both uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz signal. And then mm -hmm. it uses y, uh, MetaGeek's Y-Spy channelizer to give you a really good look of what's actually going on. It, it's basically an inexpensive uh, signal analyzer, a, a uh, what do you call those things? Like a spectrum analyzer. Uh, yeah. have, have, have you ever played with one of those, Chase? 
Uh, only and only in the stuff that's built into like uh, I have a uh, Asus router that I run Tomato firmware on, and so I've run the analyzer on that to try to improve my Wi-Fi and make sure I'm hitting the right channels with less interference and such. So I've used them, but built into the Tomato firmware. Got it. Got it. And one of the things I really like about the software is that it doesn't just show you what the what's going on in the Wi-Fi yeah. spectrum. There's a lot of free tools out there. You can actually get them for your iOS or, or Android device or even Windows laptop, Mac laptop, that will show you what's going on in the channels, what kind of, of clients and APs you've got in the area. But this will show you things like microwaves, and it will actually give you the tools so you can figure out what might be stepping on your frequencies. Here in the brick house, this is absolutely vital because, well, we, we need to know why things keep breaking on the wireless spectrum. It's just because the area is so noisy. Yeah. I uh, I did a quick segment with, uh, with this a while back for... Uh, for uh, my, my other show, This Week in Enterprise Tech. Yeah, you want to take a look? Sure, let's take a look. All right. I'm here at the MetaGeek booth with Trent Cutler, and uh, he's going to help us track down a little phenomenon. Uh, Trent, exactly what are we looking at right now? Well, right now, um, we've got an odd spike in the spectrum uh, near Wi-Fi channel 11. And we are curious what it was, so we're gonna use the new uh, feature that we've implemented that tracks down devices. So we call it Device Finder. And that's that's in cooperation with your directional antenna? Correct, so as you as you move it around, it's like a flashlight, so you can find the source of interference. Okay. So ground rules are, this laptop, that y spy this antenna, we're gonna find something on the show floor that seems to be buzzing the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So we notice a, an odd, peak of interference in the spectrum. And so what we need to do is we need to zoom in just to that source so we can go into device finder mode with the directional antenna and track it down. So we're looking at this amplitude level right here. So we're gonna walk around and find it. So I saw an increase of activity, so I'm gonna head this way. This view is also showing me um, increase of amplitude right here, so I can also watch this to see if I'm aiming the, the right way or not. So if I aim away from the source, you can see it changes colors according to the signal strength. We're getting closer. As you can see, we've we've gotten closer to the source. So we're gonna go further this way. So I'm facing the opposite way. We've had a decrease. So I'm gonna turn around. You notice these red spikes in the spectral view and the increase of activity in the device finder mode. I'm very, very close. We found the source of interference for Wi-Fi channel 11 at Interop with MetaGeek's Channelizer Pro and Device Finder. It's an interesting device, and, uh, you know, it, that is actually a segment that I did for This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's not an ad. I'm not being paid by MetaGeek. But uh, when I think about the tech that I use on a daily basis, this is definitely one of the pieces of tech that I think of. Uh, what about you, Chase? Is there any tech that has you interested right now? Well, not, not, not too much other than, you know, the big game is happening on Sunday, uh, the big super game of Hand Egg, uh, since we can't say, you know, I understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm don't. Sorry, uh, 
that thing. That anyway, thing. Uh, I will say this. The technology surrounding that game, I yeah. think, is really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, I believe Fox is going to have 52 different cameras set up all over the stadium, locker rooms, tunnels, under seats, in players' heads, uh, maybe even on the Gatorade bucket. Who knows? Uh, they're going to have sensors in the grass uh, so they can actually tell us how cold the grass is and how it's going to you know, possibly change the aspects of the game. Uh, obviously, Fox is going to be streaming uh, the game, so I'm obviously uh, interested in that aspect. So that kind of tech this week I've been really uh, been glued to. It just I love to see the kind of envelopes because we've seen it happen on the Super Bowl, uh, the biggest event in the world, the biggest sporting event in the world where you've seen always new tech uh, being innovative. Uh, so can't wait to see that. Yeah, I actually have a couple of uh, colleagues who are doing tech for the Super Game. Super Game. Super Game. For the Super Game. That uh, a couple of them are working on Wi-Fi. A few of them are doing some of the, the, the straight up wired networking. And I there are going to be more sensors in that stadium than I think I've ever existed in all of sports. I mean, it's, it's crazy. When I start looking at some of the articles that are talking about the different teams that are installing different pieces of tech to make sure, that, you know, not, I'm not just talking about safety and surveillance stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about stuff that the NFL has asked for so they could do these awesome views of exactly where the balls are, what the players are yeah. doing. And it's, it's, it's actually pretty impressive just to yeah. look at the logistics, what it takes to put all that tech and make it work without killing each other. Yeah, and just for one game, right? You know, yeah, just one for, game, right? Just for one game, <laughs> which tells you how crazy profitable that one game is. If you yeah. can afford, if you can write off thirty million dollars in tech expenses that will be used one time, and say, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's just price of doing business." You you know that yeah, they're making they're making book. <laughs> to take that Wi-Fi analyzer across the stadium, I bet right. you there's going to be interference everywhere. <laughs> I, I will say this: there is a uh, company that I deal with on a regular basis that makes fiber products and fiber analysis products, they uh, developed a process by which you can embed fiber into concrete flooring. Oh, wow. Uh, and what happens, and, and it's, it's not used for transmission, transmission of data. What they found out is a very good way, a very inexpensive way to figure out where people are because even the subtle pressure that you get on the fiber that's within concrete will tell you how many people are standing above it, where they're moving, where the weight distribution is. It's it's amazing technology. And they said, oh yeah, we're testing it out at the Super Game. Like, <laughs> the oh, Super Game. Really? Well, and in all, you know, for, you know, the Niners, you know, they got their new stadium yeah. uh, down in Santa Clara. Well, I think of the technology. I mean, they've already talked about how it's going to be the most connected stadium in all of the NFL and how they're, they're setting up these Wi-Fi mesh networks. And it's just that kind of technology. I mean, I'm a big sports geek. I know you are too. We love sports, but we also love the geek inside those sports. And I and I I can't wait for the big game and also for the new stadium to open up. I think it's gonna be really cool. Yeah, I don't I don't have to think about the technology. We're <laughs> actually doing a, a episode of this week's yes. Enterprise Tech from the nice. new stadium. We'll be broadcasting oh, great. with one of their engineers who's gonna take us through and show us all the little nooks and crannies. Although he said there's a lot there's there's actually a lot in the stadium that he's not allowed to show. Just for security wow. reasons. They they're not allowed to show off some of the uh the more interesting tech. I'm like, oh, okay, right, any tech, that's fine for me. Yeah. And then I asked, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> maybe we could do that during the opening game. That would be, that would be nice. Well, you know, the the Seattle the Seattle Mariners, you know, they have the largest HD screen of all of uh, Major League Baseball. They installed it last year, and you know, the resolution, you know, it, it's so big, it's so huge, and it looks phenomenal. So, I mean, and uh, uh, one of the sportscasters that I follow on Twitter. Uh, he took pictures of inside the control room, and it's literally, you know, like you know NASA, like you know Mission Control. You know, take a take what you got there at Twit, and you know magnify it. And so that that kind of tech, just I just like, oh, that's so cool. Can I just hang out there for a day? That's just so neat, you know. That's so can't wait for that. Geeks paradise. Yeah. Now, Chase, we have reached the end of this episode of Padres Corner. I want to thank you for coming on. Um, I, I, I've been wanting to have you. You know this. I, I promised you that I'd get you on the Twitch stream at some point in the near future. I wanted to have you on. And you know what? I, I want to invite you back at some point. So as soon as we figure out how this is going to work, uh, would you be willing to come back and talk to the good folks in chat room? Oh, the chat room is what makes this place the best. I mean, you're, it, you're cool to hang out with, Padre, but that, that chat room is awesome. You know, it's an instant community on demand it's it's great and i'd love to come back be a lot of fun fantastic now uh, thank you uh, you again for coming on would you please tell people 
where they can find you, where they can find your programming. I know that you you want to make this a, a life thing. You want to be able to do to live the dream, to, yeah. to do stuff like Twit. Uh, where can people find your content? Where can they find you? Uh, they can follow the content at geekgamer.tv. That's the website address. And from there, you can go off to YouTube and Facebook, wherever you want. Uh, but all the central content is posted there. And if people want to uh, follow the network, it's at Geek Gamer TV. And they can follow me directly and all my crazy antics, especially when it comes to hashtag boom uh, at Nunes, N-U-N-E-S. People can follow me there. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Now, you can find me. You can find me at the, my YouTube channel. I, this is not actually an official Twitch show. This is something that I, I'm, I'm doing and Leo and Lisa are, are allowing me to do on Fridays. Follow me at Twitter, uh, sorry, youtube.com slash Padre SJ. I don't have much up right now. It's That was a personal page from way, way back, but I'm going to be converting it for use by Padre's Corner. So uh, please stop on by, subscribe so that we can get all this stuff out to you. In fact, I think at some point we're going to try to broadcast these live over YouTube so that we can we can get the episodes automatically up and running. Also, did you know that I'm, I'm actually a regular host on Twit TV? Yeah, I, I do four shows during the week. I'd really love it if you came by and, and watched, or even if you, you, you downloaded our episodes after the fact. I'm on Twiet, This Week in Enterprise Tech, Mondays at 2.30 p.m. I'm on Tech News Tonight on Tuesdays at 4 o'clock p.m. I'm on Know How at 12.30 on Thursdays. And I'm on Coding 101 at 1.30, 1 also on Thursdays, all time in Pacific. Go ahead and stop by, say hi. Make sure you jump in the chat room because we do these shows live. And believe it or not, I actually read your comments during the show. I integrate them into the show. Again, it's part of the experience of twit.tv. Also, follow me on Twitter. Please tell your friends about me. Uh, jump over to twitter.com slash Padre SJ. That's at Padre SJ. And not only will you be able to follow what I'm doing, but I'm going to use Twitter as a way for you to tell me who you want to appear on Padre's Corner. Till that time comes, thank you very much for watching. Thanks to Chase Noons for uh, being our guest. Thanks to Lisa and Leo for letting us do this. And uh, that's the end of Padre's Corner.